Okay, assalamu alaikum and hello. I'm Azlina and I will be your MC for today's inaugural lecture. Thank you for joining us for the session today. Um, before the event begins officially, uh, we have some housekeeping rules to ensure that this event runs smoothly. So first of all, please kindly keep your mic on mute the entire time. Switch to gallery view display in Zoom. And please stay back for a photo session after the lecture. Your cooperation is highly appreciated. And we also welcome your participation to add some extra poignancy and atmosphere to this virtual event and hope um, that you can leave some greetings and any messages that you may have for Prof. Nortina in the comment section in the, for those joining on YouTube. Okay, so we will begin shortly at 3 p.m. Thank you so much.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera diucapkan kepada semua hadirin yang dihormati. Selamat datang ke syarahan Perdana Profesor Dr. Nortina Shahrizaila hari ini. Izinkan saya untuk bercakap dalam bahasa Inggeris untuk para hadirin dari luar negara. Selamat datang and a very well, very warm welcome to distinguished guests, Professor Nortina's parents, family and friends, fellow professors, academicians, doctors, researchers and colleagues to this special event hosted by the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Thank you for joining us over Zoom and to all those who are watching on the YouTube live stream. I am Associate Professor Dr. Zinam Anwar from the Department of Biomedical Science Faculty of Medicine and I'm delighted to serve as the Master of Ceremony for the inaugural lecture of a dear friend and great colleague Professor Dr. Nortina Shahrizaila. Professor Nortina is a professor of neurology and consultant neurologist from the Neurology Unit Department of Medicine here at the Faculty of Medicine. A professor's inaugural lecture is one of University Malaya's cherished traditions aimed to honor the professional journeys taken by our professors, a time for them to share with us their stories and what inspired them their philosophies. Today we have the wonderful opportunity to listen and learn as Professor Notina recollects and reflects on her journey over the past uh, 20 years, making significant impact and meaningful contribution to her field of speciality. I've seen firsthand her drive and passion, her deep sense of responsibility for her, pa for her patients and her drive to give back to the community, as many of you have also witnessed, I'm sure. Now established as a key leader in her field, Professor Nortina will shortly stand before us here today, enlightening us about her journey through thick and thin, exploring the nerves. And so to begin, firstly, permit me to announce the arrival of our Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Professor Dr. April Kamila Roslani, accompanied by Professor Dr. Nortina Shahrizaila. Without further ado, we shall start this inaugural lecture with the national anthem, followed by the University of Malaya song.
if I may now invite Prof. April and Prof. Nortina to have a seat. Okay, it is now with great pleasure that I would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Prof. April, to chair the lecture and introduce Professor Nortina. Welcome, Prof. April. Distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies, and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum, salam sejahtera, and greetings to you all, wherever you may be. When non neurologists think about the field, we perhaps tend to focus on disorders of the brain. Yet, just as a central processing unit is the brain of a computer, you and I know how frustrating and disruptive it is when the cables or connections malfunction analogous to the dysfunction of the nerves. While there has been much progress in unraveling the secrets of neurological diseases, they remain mystifying for many of us. It therefore gives me great pleasure to welcome you to University of Malaya's first inaugural lecture of 2022, intriguingly titled, Through Thick and Thin, Exploring the Nerves. This, I am proud to say, will be delivered by Professor Dr. Nortina Sharizaila, who is Professor of Neurology at the Department of Internal Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University Malaya, as well as Senior Consultant Neurologist at University Malaya Medical Center. Professor Nortina graduated from the University of Nottingham Medical School, United Kingdom, in 1997. She went on to complete her general medical training doctoral degree and specialist neurology training in the UK, rotating through tertiary neurology centres, including Queen's Medical Centre, Nottingham, and the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, Queen Square, in London. She joined University of Malaya in 2009 as an Associate Professor of Neurology, as well as Consultant Neurologist at University of Malaya Medical Centre. She chose to focus her subspecialty clinical and research interests in neuromuscular disorders, specifically peripheral neuropathies and motor neuron disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. The clinical and research work she has led in Guillain-Barré syndrome has received international recognition. This includes the acknowledgement of UMMC as a center of excellence for the management of immune-mediated neuropathies by the International GBS CIDP Foundation, the only center in Southeast Asia, as well as an invitation by The Lancet to lead a recently published review on GBS. Professor Nortina was promoted to Professor of Neurology in 2015. In that same year, she spent her sabbatical as a visiting scholar at the University of Sydney pursuing her interests in MND. She now leads the University of Malaya MND group, comprising colleagues from multiple specialties, including palliative medicine, rehabilitation medicine, gastroenterology, anesthesia, respiratory medicine, and biomedical sciences. Internationally, she is involved in multiple collaborative networks. This includes the International GBS Outcome Study, where she is a task force member of the Electrodiagnostic Expertise Group, having previously served as its lead from 2016 to 2019. She is also currently the co-chair of the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology Education Committee. She serves on the Education Committee of the Peripheral Nerve Society, as well as the board of the Pan-Asian Consortium for Treatment and Research in ALS. With these credentials, I think there needs to be no further justification for Professor Nortina's inaugural lecture today. And so without further delay, may I invite her to take the rostrum. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor April, for that very kind introduction. 
Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank um, our MC for today, um, Associate Professor Dr. Azlina. She very kindly agreed to MC, and Azlina is certainly somebody who has been very much involved in the work that I'm about to present today. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, first of all, for joining um, in this inaugural lecture. So what I'm going to do today is, is really go through the journey that I went through. You know, they do say that we're shaped by the experiences that we've gone through and also the people that we've met along the way. So this lecture is really just talking to you about the experience that I went through and also the people that I've met along the way that's shaped the person that I am today. So I think it's always good to really start from early on, and I'm not going to start too far back. It's probably best to start during my medical career. So I graduated, as Prof. April had mentioned, from University of Nottingham back in 1997. I decided that you know medicine was really what I wanted to do, and went on to do my medical rotation in Derby, following which, after getting my MRCP, I then had to decide you know, what specialty was I going to do now. And at the time, I wasn't really sure. But there was certainly a position that was available in Nottingham. And this was at the teaching hospital in Nottingham, um, which, is where, you know, which was where I studied. And um, there was a neuro neurology position there. And I don't know whether or not, you know, there was a co probably a combination of various factors that led me to decide that neurology was definitely for me. Certainly, when I first started in neurology there, my, you know, my knowledge was basic at best. You know, I probably knew enough to perhaps pass the MRCP. So suddenly, I was doing this specialty that, to me, was something completely new, something that was really quite fresh and really very interesting. And um, so that was one factor. And the other factor was also the people that I met and that I worked with one of whom is Dr. Adrian Wills here. So he was the consultant that I was working with at the time, and he was somebody that was subspecializing in neuromuscular disorders. And at the same time, I was also working with a group of wonderful colleagues, um, and we were quite a close-knit um, group. So I've got here, um, I've put Connie um, as a separate because she was actually the one that was taking the photo. But one of the things that left an impression um, to me at that time was that each and every one of these individuals had done some form of research. So they had either just completed a PhD or an MD in neurology, or they were in the midst of doing an MD in neurology. So that was really what neurology was like back in the UK when I was working in Nottingham. It was very much an academic um, specialty. But, you know, I, I spent about a year, just over a year, because I thought, you know, I really ought to come back just to see um, what, you know, what, what it was like here. And I think this was something, I must apologize to Prof. April, I forgot to mention this, but actually my first appointment was back in 2002. And at the time, I had come back and joined the neurology unit. And it was a very you know, different environment, certainly to what I had just left from the UK. And, um, and what was different was that neurology here in Malaysia, and certainly at UM, was um, part of, certainly very much part of internal medicine. And as a lecturer in medicine, which was my appointment at that time, it did, you know, it did involve doing a lot of internal medicine and also doing stroke as part of neurology. And I don't say this you know, to criticize. It's basically, it was really important for me to understand what the landscape was like back in Malaysia. And, you know, and it's, it's wonderful that in Nottingham, yes, you know, one can cherry pick your cases um, doing neurology, but that's not really the reality. But nevertheless, um, I didn't last very long. So I lasted for about all of six months. And you know, some might think that I left because I couldn't cope. Um, you know, there, there are other reasons which I'll tell you about, but that six months was valuable. 
I, you know, it was valuable to just spend that time. And one of the important things that happened during that time was then met this young man, which of course you will all know as Professor Go. I don't think he was professor at the time, but Prof Go and a senior um, medical lab technologist at the time called Mr. Rahman. So they were instrumental at introducing me to nerve conduction studies because I really did not have a clue. And that was really important. And to me, you know, Prof Go certainly was one of my very earliest mentor. So anyway, needless to say, off I went back, and I didn't go very far, I went back to where I came from. And the reason for that was by this stage, I knew not only did I want to do neurology, I wanted to do research, and I wanted to really be part of academic neurology. And Adrian, who was my previous consultant, had you know, a position, he had some funding, so he called and I thought, okay, well fine, let's do this. And together with Will Kinnear, who was the respiratory physician, they were both my clinical supervisor, along with uh, Professor Chris Constantinescu, who was my academic supervisor. I went on to spend two years as a research registrar, and I did, um, my thesis was on respiratory involvement in inherited muscle disorders. So during that time, because it was a clinical research registrar position, I was also doing the neuromuscular clinics with Adrian. And this was very exciting because this was the first, you know, this was the first publication for me. And it was this incredibly interesting family that presented with this muscle disorder. And not just a muscle disorder, but they also had this association of abnormal pupil, where it was absolutely tiny pinpoint pupils. And if you looked in the literature, this had never ever been described before. So I remember you know, going around um, England, sort of looking at the different family members, examining them, you know, consenting them, taking bloods, et cetera. And we were able to write this up and, and publish in neurology, which is you know, a pretty decent journal. And that was back in 2004. I mean, these days, there is no way you know, neurology would even entertain a case report. Um, but that was, you know, that was quite exciting, certainly for me, to try and figure out you know, what was really going on, to come up with the case. And what I didn't realize at the time was that what we did, even though it was a case report, it was actually quite important because 10 years later, little did I know that this case report would be one of another case report, and someone would have actually found the, you know, the gene that was involved and the mutation of the two genes that are involved that causes this particular syndrome. And they were very, you know, I didn't really do, I mean, I was invited as a co-author just really for the, you know, clinical aspect of things. And I certainly didn't have, you know, anything to do with all the fancy, clever stuff. But, you know, it put us on the map because by that stage, I'd really returned to Malaysia and was part of the academic staff here. And what that demonstrates is that, you know, a case report that can take you places. So... I finished my research, so went back to my clinical training, and I continued, completed my training in Nottingham. And this is where, just to give you a bit of a background, so in the UK, clinical neurophysiology is considered a separate subspecialty. So most neurologists don't actually do clinical neurophysiology. So that was the reason why, you know, back in 2002, Prof Go teaching me nerve conduction studies was actually really important because I seriously did not know how to do them then. Um, but I knew that you know, I wanted to go back home, so I would need to really learn to do clinical neurophysiology because I now know what to expect. And of course, I wanted to do neuromuscular disorders, so that's crucial. So I was very fortunate because I was introduced to Professor Martin Kultzenberg, who was the lead of the clinical neurophysiology department there, then and also now. And he was happy to have me work there to train. And specifically, I focus on doing the peripheral neurophysiology. And those of you who are in the neurology field will know that you know, the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at Queen Square is clearly you know, one of the top centers, if not the top centers in, in the world. And, um, and that experience was certainly you know, phenomenal for me in terms of the teaching. 
Um, and having done all of that, it was now time to stop messing about and basically come back. So this was really, uh, so this is when I first contacted Prof Siti Tan, and I was very fortunate that Prof Tan, um, you know, was willing to give me a second chance. I think he was also, you know, quite pleased that I didn't, it wasn't really so much that I couldn't cope, but it, I was serious about doing academic um, neurology. So Prof Tan was, um, you know, was, was supportive. And I also went back to speak to Prof Amin, who at this stage was the Deputy Vice Chancellor, so he was also willing to give me a second chance. And that was when I was appointed, now that with my MD and some publications, I was appointed as Associate Press in Neurology. And that was back in 2009. And, um, Basically, you know, I just want to give you a bit of a background just to see what is it that, you know, the journey that I'd gone through, just so that you kind of understand um, the journey thereafter. So I maintain my subspecialty interest in neuromuscular disorders, and what that is, is essentially it is representing the peripheral nervous system. So all the way from your anterior horn cells, all the way to your peripheral nerves, and also your nerve and muscle junction, and also the muscle. And you know, at that time, UM Neurology Unit, you know, they were well known for the encephalitis work. So the pedigree was there. And also Prof Go had done a remarkable job in terms of setting up the clinical neurophysiology, you know, in terms of nerve conduction studies and EMG over at UMMC. So the conditions were really, really good to, to now start thinking about doing research and to see what else can we do to, to kind of advance this field. And again, it started with um, you know, another interesting family. And this time, it was a family that had inherited peripheral neuropathy, so that is Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. And what was unusual about this family was that some family members also had a blood disorder called hemophilia. So to me, you know, and it look, I looked up in the literature and this was not reported before and I thought, oh, you know, this could be something really exciting here. So, and at the time, and this was back in 2009, doing genetics was not that straightforward. You know, it was incredibly expensive one would have to look for you know, single gene mutations. So that just becomes incredibly um, uh, costly for the patients. So I then thought, you know, what could we do? And um, so I looked at the region just to see you know, who was around that was actually working in this. And I was very fortunate because in Australia, in Sydney, there was Professor Garth Nicholson, who was based at Anzac Research Institute. And I sent an email to Garth and till today, I'm incredibly grateful to him because, you know, unlike, you know, the chocolate there that he got for Christmas, he didn't ask me to get lost. He was actually incredibly supportive. And he also introduced me to this wonderful person who was his principal scientist at the time, who's Professor Marina Kennison. So the two of them were certainly willing to support to try and work out this family. So when I looked within, within FOM, and, you know, tucked away, and I think it was Department of Molecular Medicine at that time, rather than Biomedical Sciences, there was this, you know, pretty amazing um, doctor who, who did a PhD in neurogenetics, and that's our MC for today, Azlina. And, you know, and Azlina's got like a PhD in neurogenetics from Imperial and also UCL. So all of us worked together and you know, we were able to publish. I mean, it was a letter to the editor, but that wasn't the point. It was just kind of like the inquisitiveness and also working the family up. And this meant a lot um, certainly to us because you know, this was putting us on the map in terms of um, you know, showing our interest in this field. So that was how that all started, but that's really not the focus of my, um, my lecture today because my main interest is, is really with regards to the immune-mediated neuropathies and specifically in Guillain-Barre syndrome. But what I wanted, you know, the reason I talked about that was first, you know, just finding someone that believed in what you're doing, that's willing to support you. So when I wrote to Garth, the other thing that he did was also in his email, he invited me to go across to Sydney to attend the Peripheral Nerve Society satellite meeting. And they were hosting it there. And that was really important because I went 
and you know, and suddenly you were meeting all of these experts, and um, and one of the individuals that I met there that would have a significant impact, certainly in my research in Guillain-Barre syndrome, was Professor Nobuhiro Yuki. So Nobuhiro Yuki, to me, exemplifies what it is to be a clinician scientist, and the work that he did on Guillain-Barre syndrome and the anti gagnoside antibodies is really phenomenal. But I'm just gonna pause for a while just to give you a very brief overview of what Guillain-Barre or GBS is. So GBS is the most frequent post-infectious flaccid paralysis. It occurs acutely, it's immune mediated, and typically a patient would have an antecedent illness. So that means that they would have you know, some form of infection, it could be flu-like symptoms, it could be diarrhea. And how one diagnoses this is with neurophysiology, nerve conduction studies that is, and also looking at the cerebrospinal fluid, looking for that imbalance between albumin uh, and cell count. So pathophysiology of GBS, well, essentially, what happens is that your own body starts to mount an immune response towards the peripheral nerve. And depending on where the target antigen is, so that means you know, the site of where, um, where the attack is, it would either target the myelin, which is you know, the, the, outer surf, uh, the outer coating of the nerve, or the axons. And the thing about GBS, you know, it's out of the many neurological disorders, this is the one thing that is quite hopeful because it's a one-off event. So in most of the cases, patients have it once in their lifetime. It's immune mediated, which means that if you were able to you know, give them IVIG, uh, sorry, uh, intravenous immunoglobulin or plasma exchange, those are forms of immunotherapy, patients tend to do well. Certainly in 80% of patients, they do recover to normal. In 20% in about the first year, they might not be able to walk. And if you were to do ultrasound, which is what we subsequently did, you would see, and this was done with my master's student, you would see that the nerve is actually enlarged, you know, suggesting that, and that's really what you see in immune-mediated neuropathies, this enlargement of nerves. So going back to um, Yuki, so the work that he did I thought was remarkable because he was definitely, his group was, was, um, was able to come up with this kind of pathophysiology of what was happening in GBS that was associated with a diarrhea caused by Campylobacter jejuni. And there's this concept of molecular mimicry. And what that is, is that they were able to demonstrate that there are components within our peripheral nerve that looks very similar to the outer coating of the bug. So in this case, the Campylobacter jejuni. And what they then went on to do was to develop and replicate GBS in an animal model by using a strain that had previously been isolated from a patient. And then they went on to demonstrate that depending on the type of strain of GBS that you had, then the type of, sorry, depending on the type, the strain of Campylobacter jejuni that you had, the type of GBS that you developed was also very different. And I just thought this was really remarkable because that, this demonstrate that kind of like, you know, bedside to bench and bench back to bedside kind of um, translational medicine that I think, you know, as a clinician, we always have to try and strive for. So, you know, I was really inspired and during that time, um, Yuki had been given his position in National University of Singapore. And of course, you know, at this stage, you know, I thought, you know, I also want to be a scientist, but doing that would mean having to take another leave of absence. And I just started at UM, obviously. And also, you know, my heart is really in clinical neurology anyway. But I was very fortunate because um, over a period of three years, I was able to get a visiting research position, which meant that I could spend short periods of time to do some immunology work in his lab. And Azlina was also um, very helpful in, in the sense that she also offered some bench space for me to do some of the serology work over here at UM. But one of the things that I decided to look into, and, and mainly because you know, this was my strength, um, was looking at the electrodiagnosis of GBS. And it just so happened that you know, there was a lot of buzz at the time with regards to how the electrodiagnosis of GBS is not quite 
um, as accurate as one had thought before this. So essentially, uh, and this was really based on the uh, work done by two groups of people. So there was the Japanese group led by Satoshi Kobara and also the Italian group um, led by Antonino Incini. And what they had demonstrated is that if you were to do just a single um, set of nerve conduction studies, that was insufficient to really tell you what was the underlying pathophysiology, what was the target, was it the, is it the myelin or the axon? So it is rather deceptive and that you would need multiple nerve conduction studies to really be able to tell where the pathology is. So, you know, inspired by that, I thought, well, okay, well, we were doing already a lot of the serology work, and this was work that I was doing with Yuki's group over in Singapore as well. So focusing on the electrodiagnosis just back in UM, um, we then investigated to see whether is this true. So prospectively, we also found that we were seeing similar changes to others elsewhere, and these were not always associated with Campylobacter jejuni. And of course, you know, doing multiple nerve conduction studies is not something that's realistic. And, and certainly, you know, in terms of resource, it's not brilliant. So we then looked into, you know, what sort of time, you know, how many sets of NCS really would be sufficient. And we found that, you know, just doing two sets over a period of eight weeks is probably sufficient. And that has since been, of course, you know, the standard if you were doing um, two sets of NCS. And this work was uh, fortunate, we were fortunate because this work was supported by the UM Research Grant. So having done that and, you know, moving in the circle of the peripheral nerve experts in the societies and also, you know, having worked on some of the serology work as well, I was able to actually, um, in collaboration with Antonino and also Satoshi, look further into the Zika related GPS, because if you remember back in 2016, there was an epidemic over in Latin America, and although that wasn't you know, a big problem here in Malaysia, neither was it a problem in Italy or in Japan, what we did was actually we reviewed the reports that were coming out from Latin America, and in particular, we looked in greater detail at the nerve conduction study data, just to see whether what was being reported was truly reflective of what the possible underlying pathophysiology was. And this was work that we did, and we continued to work together, and this was work led by Antonino Uncini, where we then proposed a new set of electrodiagnostic criteria that was based on the two sets of nerve conduction studies. So then, you know, um, we thought that, well, let's try and do something more locally. And I was very fortunate because my colleague, um, Dr. Tan, was, um, very interested in immune-mediated neuropathy, and currently he is the person that is now, you know, hopefully going to be taking over a lot of this work as well, uh, or at least work, you know, you know, working with me. And and what we did was actually put together um, a model, a disease model, using the neurophysiology um, parameters to see whether one could simply predict and differentiate between the exonal and demyelinating forms of GBS. So, so we were doing all of this, and um, one of the things that we wanted to try and elucidate was what was the actual infection that was triggering GBS locally? And, um, you know, we know that Campylobacter is not a big problem here. So for this, we sought the help of Professor Jamal Aiching Sam, who also happens to be a University of Nottingham alum. And I've chosen Jamal's Sharahan Pradhana um, picture because he was responsible, well, he is responsible for the fact that I'm actually doing my inaugural lecture because he convinced me that I could do this. And Jamal was wonderful in that, you know, working with him, we looked into dengue because you know, dengue is a hyperendemic in Malaysia, obviously. And interestingly, we found that 20% of patients with GBS had a recent dengue infection, and this was versus neurological controls. And this was something that, you know, certainly merits looking into further because, and, and what we were seeing was that the type of GBS that this was triggering was very different to the GBS that Campylobacter jejuni would trigger, which is an exonal form of GBS. So having done that, you know, we wanted to also not just work in silo, we wanted to be able to contribute towards the global um, GBS community. 
And so this is when, you know, um, in one of the meetings, I met Professor Bart Jacobs, who is based in Netherlands, and Bart is the lead of the International GBS Outcome Study, and he was happy to have Malaysia on board. So therefore now, you know, it's nice to have Malaysia representing in the global GBS research. And these, the work that's coming out from this collaboration has been instrumental at trying to, you know, elucidate the cases and the true pathophysiology so that we can come up with better treatment. And I think that together with, you know, the body of work that we had done here has kind of put us on a map because as Prof. April had mentioned earlier, it has acknowledged, um, you know, the International GBS CIDP Foundation um, acknowledges, uh, recognize um, UMMC in particular as a center of excellence for immune-mediated neuropathy. So I'm now gonna change Tech. And it's not that I, you know, I finished with GBS and now I've moved on to MND. I mean, it is in this lecture, but behind the scene, whilst we were working on the GBS, we were also, you know, working on on patients with motor neuron disease. And this is a completely different disease in that, you know, where GBS, it's immune mediated. You know, the prognosis is pretty good. With motor neuron disease, also referred to as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, there is progressive degeneration of the motor nerves. And as a result, what would happen is that patients would become paralyzed, they'd have problems with speaking, problems with swallowing, and eventually they would also have problems with breathing, and that is what results in the terminal outcome. And unfortunately, at present, you know, there isn't a cure and um, management of patients with motor neuron disease is largely supportive. And this is really to, to ensure that you know, we try to improve the quality of life. I've highlighted, you yeah, have added two pictures, and that is Stephen Hawking and also our own national football icon, uh, Mokhtar Dahari, both of whom are thought to have died from motor neuron disease. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time just to kind of use this platform to raise awareness on MND. Um, because it's such a devastating disease. And why is it that it happens in about 10% of patients, it does run in families, so that means we know there are mutations in uh, common genes that are associated with MND. But in 90% of the case, we don't really know what's going on. So what we think is that, you know, it's probably a combination of several factors working together that kind of suddenly increases your risk for developing MND. So it's several steps that you would need to kind of tip the balance that would start triggering the degeneration of the nerve. And if you carried the known uh, mutation in the known gene, those steps would be fewer. But in the majority, we don't know that there is a mutation. So as we said, in 90%, so you would get between five to six steps in those sort of situation. And what are these steps? So. The steps could still be genetic, so we could be a genetic risk modifier, some sort of variant, but it would be working in conjunction with potentially something that you're exposed to in the environment. It could be, you know, maybe a bug that you're exposed to. It could be the behavior. You may be somebody who's super active, somebody who smokes, and certainly the aging process is associated with generative disorders. So looking at the pathophysiology as well, it's incredibly complicated. There are multiple mechanisms that are involved in triggering this process. So you'll see here in the diagram all the different you know, types of gene that has been associated with the different types of mechanism that's involved in degenerative diseases. And if you were to do the ultrasound on this group of patients, because it is degenerative, you'll find that the nerves become thinner as opposed to thicker like we saw in the immune-mediated neuropathies. So in approaching MND, you know, what I did was basically looked at, you know, my past and looked at my previous experience, and that was back in Nottingham. And even though that was about 15 years ago, there were certainly already dedicated clinics looking after patients with MND, with specialist nurses. And um, one of the reasons for that is because the government had mandated that patients should have an established standard of care. And this was determined by NICE, which is the National Institute for Healthcare and Excellence back in the UK. And the two things that they highlight is, one is rilazole, and although rilazole is a drug, it doesn't, that doesn't cure the patient, it does, however, slow disease progression. And 
it only slows it maybe by a few months, but certainly it was enough for them to um, mandate, it, that, mandate that patients, all patients, should really have access to this drug. The other thing that was also advocated is multidisciplinary team approach, because there was a lot of evidence to suggest that this not only prolongs life, uh, sorry, patient's life, but also change, it makes a huge difference in terms of quality of life. So we looked back at our local MND experience, and certainly back in 2009, there weren't really any dedicated clinics or specialists that were specifically looking at MND, and most patients would be seen by a neurologist without very much support coming from uh, the other disciplines. And looking at UMMC themselves, patients would typically be seen in the general neurology clinic, and what would happen is that we would, lose, we would lose a lot of patients to follow up um, because you know, we were not really able to keep track of them. And there were instances where there were several cases that would come through emergency in respiratory distress necessitating them being invasively intubated, which would then lead to a prolonged stay in ICU with an unfortunately um, terminal outcome at the end. And if you look at what has been reported in terms of global MND burden, it, you know, you've got this map. So basically, if it's red or orange, or um, so that just suggests that the prevalence is very high. If it was any shades of blue, it suggests that the prevalence is low. And if you look at Malaysia, you know, we're considered, or this region, we're considered to have a low prevalence. But looking at this map, you know, and I think we, we've seen a lot of this, you know, GBD um, maps coming through Lancet Neurology, you will see that this could also be a map that tells you which are the high-income countries and which are the low-income countries. And, and I'm not saying that that's definitely the case, but certainly this is something that we need to look into because if it's true that we are seeing a low prevalence, is there something that is happening here? Is it the environment? Is it the attitude, the behavior? Is it the, you know, the reduced genetic susceptibility? But you know, what is truly causing uh, what is perceived to be a lower uh, risk or lower susceptibility to MND? So looking back, and this is work led by Professor Go back in 2011, so looking retrospectively off, uh, at the MND patients that they had seen over the last 10 years, they found that over a 10-year period, there was only 73 patients that came to UMMC. And even if you took the most conservative of estimates of global prevalence, which is five per 100,000, for the catchment area um, within kind of UMMC, you would really expect to see at least 100 patients at any one time. So we then thought, you know, could this just be um, that patients were not being diagnosed, not being recognized, and the disease awareness was actually, you know, not, not that brilliant. So we then looked back at what was established a standard of care, so going back to this, and Riluzole um, was certainly not something that was realistic to advocate because it cost almost 2,000, um, so that was certainly not something um, that we could, we could, you know, make patients pay for, certainly because it's not a cure. But what we could maybe try and do is perhaps try and establish this multidisciplinary care approach. And in that, I was, and till today, I am incredibly, incredibly grateful to have met these two amazing ladies. Um, and that is Professor, Associate Professor Dr. Lo Yi-Chin from Palliative Medicine, and also Professor Lydia Latif from Rehab Medicine. Well, she was in rehab at UM uh, at the time. And the two of them, and the three of us kind of like came together and, you know, we kind of, we were just like-minded in that we thought, you know, we could really do a lot more. And initially, we were kind of seeing patients on an ad hoc basis. We were using kind of conference room or empty um, clinical space. Um, and then Lydia then became head of rehab medicine, so she had a bit more sway. And she then made it possible for the MND uh, multidisciplinary clinic to be hosted at the rehab um, clinic uh, down in Menara Selatan. And we were very fortunate because we also had support from uh, top management that would include Professor Nazira, who's the current director. So I am eternally, I mean, we are eternally grateful to UMMC and also to UM, you know, for supporting us in this, um, this, this ambition of ours. And, you know, and over the years, we have been able to expand on that 
Um, so Rehab Medicine now, Lydia has left and gone to Regen, but she continues to communicate with us and interact with us with regards to this. But in Rehab Medicine now, we have Dr. Chang, Dr. Chan, and also Dr. Sakina. In Palliative Medicine, we now have Dr. David as well. And we were also incredibly lucky because we also had two very dedicated people in gastroenterology who were very willing to help us when it came to inserting the gastrostomy tube for patients, and that is um, Dr. Alex Liao and also Dr. Chua Ki Huat. And when they did their endoscopy, they were uh, typically um, supported by Dr. Carolyn Yim. Sorry, Carolyn, I, you know, I took a photo from the internet. Um, but, but Carolyn has been wonderful in terms of protecting the airways whenever they're doing the endoscopy to do the PEG insertion. Also from anesthesiology, is Dr. Fitri, and him together with the palliative doctors were at the time looking after the respiratory side of things. But now we are very fortunate because we've got Dr. Ian who's just joined, and he's now part of respiratory and will be hopefully leading the respiratory care of our MND patients. So this took about 10 years in the making, but I think, you know, and you know, it's not perfect, but we're kind of getting there. And I'm incredibly grateful to this group of people. And they are sort of the leads of the different specialties. Behind the scenes, of course, you've got the therapists, the speech and language therapists, the nursing staff that also support our patient uh, or MD community. We are also incredibly um, lucky because we were able to form a memorandum of understanding with the patient advocacy group, which is MND Malaysia. And they have been crucial in terms of supporting us with regards to loaning certain equipments, for instance, BiPAP machines, eye trackers, and also in terms of raising, doing fundraising activities and public forums to raise disease awareness. So now that we've, you know, it's not perfect that, you know, we're kind of getting there in terms of the care, it was time to really see, you know, what's going on, you know, what is really happening with MND in, in our local setting. So it was time for me to get onto the email again. And even though Garth and Marina uh, were already doing work in MND and they were doing work in genetics, I was really quite interested in trying to see whether, you know, from the clinical aspect in particular, whether there was anything with clinical nephrology that we could do for our patients. And, um, and again, went back to Australia there. Um, and this is Professor Matthew Kiernan, who is one of the superstars um, in MND research. And his group's work is mainly focused on clinical neurophysiology, and he's based at University of Sydney at the Brain and Mind Center. So I wrote to Matthew, and fortunately, he wrote back, number one, and he said he was happy to host my sabbatical in Sydney. So off I went, um, and this time it was only for six months. So I went, and I went as a visiting scholar at the Brain and Mind. And I was very fortunate because at the time there was the Australian government was actually you know, advertised for this Endeavour Executive Award. And I must here thank Professor Adiba, who was the dean at the time, as well as Marina, because the two of them wrote very strong recommendation letters. And I think that that was certainly instrumental in me being given the award. So that sabbatical, even though it's six months, had three key outcomes. The first one was that I was introduced to Associate Professor Paul Tolman, and Paul was the lead for the Australian MND Registry. And they have got an incredibly comprehensive patient register. And they were very generous in that they were very much willing to show us the ropes and show us you know, what it takes to, to set up a disease register, number one. And also, what is really important is that you must you know, you must make sure that the minimum data set that you're collecting is really in sync with others that are doing it around the world. Because the idea is that when it comes to rare, relatively rare disorders such as motor neuron disease or even GBS, you will end up wanting to collaborate with others to try and get as much information as you can. And part of that is making sure that your clinical details are all in sync. So that's what we did. And you know, that is something that we're currently also hoping to, to work with others in the region to try and advocate for this patient register. 
So the second thing that happens is that you know whenever you go off and do you know a time away in a center of excellence, you undoubtedly we will meet other you know clinicians there who are also spending their fellowship there. And I was very lucky because during that time, you know, there was these three guys who were also neurologists back in their own home country, and they were also all very interested in clinical neurology. And especially Yuichi Noto, he was a wizard when it came to neuromuscular ultrasound. And he was leading a lot of the neuromuscular ultrasound projects in MND um, at the Brain and Mind. But he was happy to have me kind of tag along and, and learn from him to just kind of skill up on my own neuromuscular ultrasound skills. And, um, but I wasn't happy just to kind of like work as his psychic uh, during that period of time. I kind of wanted my own project as well. So what did I do with Matthew's blessing? I approached my two friends, Garth and Marina, who were also in Sydney, but at a different institute. And they were more than happy to let me have access and approach their patients with Shaco Mary Tooth so that I could lead you know, the work in terms of doing the neuromuscular ultrasound, specifically the quantitative muscle ultrasound in the cohort of uh, CMT patients that they had. So the third thing that happened was that you know, Matthew had initiated this collaborative group, which is the Asia Pacific, um, the Pan-Asian Consortium for Treatment and Research in ALS, or PECTELS. And that was established in about 2014. And when I was, when I'd spent my time in Sydney, and you know, he was saying, he was encouraging me, encouraging me to say, you know, what's the best way to kind of like try and bring people together? Um, to try and, and, and get more people to be part of PACTELS. And one of the ways that we did this was um, through doing a review where we brought in key opinion leaders from the region to be part of this review article, which is um, published in JNNP. At the time, uh, Matthew was actually the editor-in-chief. So since then, PACTELS has grown slowly but surely, and what we do try and do, and this was before the pandemic, was try to meet at least once a year during the international m and meeting. So now that I've done all of that, how do we put this into place locally? So the setup was that, you know, just to give you a bit of a timeline, so we had established our multidisciplinary m and team, we've got our m and prospective disease register initiated, and then, you know, by about 2017, 2018, we were in a position to look at our register and start competing for some of the grants that were coming through. And we were incredibly fortunate because we were able to get, over a period of four years, grants, grant support from FRGS, from the American ALS Association, and also from University of Sydney Southeast Asia Center. And this is one of the work that has come through in the last one year. So this was done by one of my master's students. And this was looking at the natural history and clinical features of MND in Malaysia. And what I've highlighted here, over a period of five years, we were able to recruit almost 150 patients. So if you think back to that retrospective study where we only had like 70 patients over a period of 10 years, so this is four times that number, you know, so twice the number in half that time suggesting that you know, maybe MND is not quite as rare as, as one had thought. And the other interesting thing that we found was that we were seeing a lot more patients who were of Chinese ethnicity, and we did find that patients of Indian descent appeared to have a more rapid disease progression. So the other aspect of the work that we wanted to do was to look at mutations in the common MND genes. And this is work that is led by Azlina, as well as the team led by Marina. And both Mar uh, Marina and Azlina joined me as the co-supervisors of our um, PhD student, Susanna. And Susanna looked into the mutation analysis of the common genes and found that like the other cohorts, we were also seeing the genes that were seen elsewhere, but it only represented 6%. So essentially, the majority of our patients, we do not know, again, what is actually contributing to the disease process. Leveraging on you know, the neuromuscular ultrasound skills that are developed, we then went on to look at using that together with clinical features to see whether we could predict disease progression and certainly using a combination of tools. And this is work done by Dr. To Sun Hao um, together with one of our senior MLTs, Azli and my master student, uh, Dilla. We were able to come up with a model that 
will predict fast probability of fast disease progression in MND. I mean, that is basically, you know, um, I've gone on quite a bit, but that is basically just to give you a taste of the work that we've done so far, particularly in these two diseases. Um, we've still got a long way to go, you know, certainly in GBS. You know, we, we know that potentially there might be some association with dengue, but we don't know how dengue might trigger. Um, in MND, there's certainly a lot, lot more that needs to be done. But it's nice to know that, you know, I have all these wonderful people that I can work with. And certainly, it's my ambition that we can do this, hopefully at a national level, working with my colleagues in, in other institutions. So I've acknowledged, you know, so many people in the slides before, and they have been incredibly instrumental in my journey. Uh, some of them have also, you know, were not just work colleagues, but have become some of my closest and dearest friends. Um, and there are some that I may not have mentioned. Well, first of all, I think I, I really ought to pay tribute to our patients who at the uh, darkest moment, they are still willing to be part of our research. So for that, I'm eternally grateful. I must thank you know, everybody at the neurology unit. And in particular, I want to shout out at, uh, I want to give a shout out to our uh, whole neurology lab um, especially, you know, from Lisa and Mas at the front desk and, you know, all the MLTs. I mean, they've just been such a wonderful bunch of people to work with. You know, I certainly think the Neurology Lab at UMMC is certainly one of the best I've worked at. I must again thank both heads of unit during my time here thus far, and that's Prof. Siti Tan and Prof. KJ Go, because they have certainly established such a strong foundation for the rest of us to really build on. And I really want to also, you know, acknowledge the chief technologist, the chief of the, you know, the, the one that's kind of in charge of the day-to-day -day grind work. And when I first started, it was Puan Siti, who has since retired, and now that's taken over by Puan Lechmi, who really runs a tight ship. Um, and I love the fact that, you know, nothing is impossible. It's like, you know, if you want to set up, okay, I want to set up a neuromuscular ultrasound, and, you know, she'll kind of try and find ways of making that possible. Anyway, you, you know, you've all been instrumental in my journey. I must mention the sports staff at the Department of Medicine. Okay, this is an old photo, but the reason I chose this was because it's got all the key people that I've interacted with over the years. Puan Rohana obviously has now retired. I promised to mention her name, so um, thank you so much. You know, we've got so many people in the Department of Medicine, it must be a bit of a nightmare for them to manage all of us. And, you know, I have, you know, I'm, I'm not going to mention all of my friends, so suffice to say that, you know, my friends, whether you're watching or not, you know, you know who you are, you know who are the people who have supported me over these years, and I thank you so, so much. But I must acknowledge my amazing family um, for always being there for me, and especially want to acknowledge my parents, who were there at the very start of my medical career when I graduated in Nottingham. And... Fortunately, are still here with me as I stand here to talk to you now, and I hope that I've done them proud over the years. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Nortina, for the wonderful lecture and for sharing your journey. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Prof. Ipul to back to the podium to summarize and conclude today's inaugural lecture. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. The journey through life is often through a very winding path uh, with many detours, uh, with many forks in the road. But I think Professor Notina has amply demonstrated how we should not be afraid to take those detours and to follow that winding path. Even if the final destination is unclear, as long as we know and are sure of the direction we wish to head towards, I think those detours and you know, side paths are the ones that actually will make your life enriched not just in your work sphere, but also in your personal life. You will meet many, many people, as Prof. Nortina has shown, um, who will 
not only be your friends, but will often be part of that very academic journey that leads you to greater success and to future frontiers. And so I want to thank Professor Natina for all her contributions uh, over the years. I see that she has taken on a mentorship role, and I'm sure that she will bring um, many insights to her mentees, just as she herself has benefited from the mentorship of those that came before her. So I, I hope that um, there won't be any further journeys away from us, <laughs> and that she will continue to be part of University of Malaya's journey as it seeks to transform and really be that global institution impacting the world, as is our tagline. So I want to thank all of you for being here today uh, to share in Professor Notina's um, academic journey. And I hope you have gleaned some insights, I certainly have, as to um, the um, weird and wonderful world of nerves. Um, and with that, I would like to bid you a good day and enjoy the rest of your day today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor April, for chairing this lecture today. And thank you again to Professor Nertina for your memorable and inspiring lecture. I knew you worked hard, but I didn't know this hard. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was just amazing. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to commemorate today by taking a photo with all of us together um, with all the attendees on Zoom. So if you can turn on your cameras. Um, and keep your pose until you hear my cue. All right, I think the technical team has obtained a good photo. So this concludes our event for today. Thank you again for sharing this moment with uh, Professor Nortina. And thank you, everyone. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>